There we go. Well, welcome everybody to uh, our next session in the Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas and I'm your host tonight. And so tonight we are in the ladies room and you know, the ladies room is that place where women talk about things that we might not say just anywhere. You know, maybe things that we can only say to one another because well, because let's just say we've all had some shared experiences, and this is our opportunity to talk about it, maybe vent some frustration, give advice to one another, and come away with some new ideas or validation. In the ladies' room, we like to say, we go there. You might notice something a little different about this edition of In the Ladies Room, and that is that we've let a couple of dudes in here with us. So don't get alarmed, it's okay. It goes along with the topic, it's gonna be all right, and everyone is happy and, and comfortable with them hanging out in the ladies room with us. And our session tonight is gonna last for about an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our panelists and the attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. This is not to be a one-way conversation. This is not an interview. We're looking for a dialogue and a, and a conversation to happen here. So if you have something though that you'd like to say anonymously, you can put it in the chat to me and I'd be happy to share with you. Now our topic today is why gender equality is good for everyone, including men. And I am really excited about this panel of special guests. And let me just tell you a little bit about them. So first of all, let's start with one of the dudes. And it's Knight Campbell is the CEO, Knight, give everybody a wave, CEO of Cairn Leadership Strategies, where he and his team develop leaders through outdoor adventures, coupled with gritty experiential learning, rigorous leadership study, and executive leadership coaching. Their programs offer growth-minded communities and action-oriented solutions for emerging leaders, women leaders, and executives. So welcome, Knight. Thank Next, you. we've got Vasi Huntalis. Vasi, give everybody a wave. And mm -hmm. Vasi guides women entrepreneurs who want to make their next level of impact with clarity, ease, and innovation. She's an intuitive coach, workshop leader, and an artist who inspires entrepreneurs to use their creativity and intuition so they can more easily scale, pivot, and lead their bold vision. Next, we have Linda Patton of Dare to Lead with Linda. And Linda is on a mission to do nothing less, I mean, this is not a big feat or not, but fundamentally change how leadership is done in the world. Linda coined the concept of confluence in leadership blending the masculine style of command with the feminine style of influence to create a whole different view of what leadership can and should be. So Linda, give everybody a wave so they know who you are. Next, we have Ed Quinlan. Ed's an executive level business leader, and he's recognized for his expertise in the wholesale process of acquiring and retaining customers maximizing revenue, and ensuring that these systems are fully sustainable. Ed takes an involved, roll up your sleeves kind of approach to business consulting. So Ed, and you should probably know who Ed is because he's the last <laughs> dude, right? <laughs> and then finally, we have Jennifer Barnes. And Jennifer is the CEO of Optima Office, Inc., where she and her team provide accounting specialists, fractional CFO services, and HR experts on a part-time ongoing and on-site or remote basis to clients of all sizes. They take the time to carefully understand their clients' needs so they can deliver a custom experience that provides consistent and reliable results. So, wow, that was a mouthful. So everybody wave again and let's get this party started. So first of all, I came up with this idea after hearing um, Michael Kemmel do a TED talk uh, it, with this same title. And you know, his, um, his position was that uh, gender equality is good in countries, it's good in companies, and it's good 
just for people in general, you know, in relationship and stuff. And I thought, well, that's kind of intriguing. So I thought, what if I pulled a bunch of folks into the ladies room and we started talking about that to see, is that true? Do we believe that? Have we experienced that? Are we unfortunate enough to have never experienced that? So who's got an opinion? You know, there's, there's like nine boxes here and I know we have nine opinions <laughs> represented here. So who wants to kick it off? Go ahead, Linda. Okay. Um, having come out of the military, there is definitely not, or at least that time, gender equality. But the good news was the fact that the Women's Army Corps was a separate entity. We had our own standards for bringing in women uh, that were higher than the men's. And we actually were, we had our own um, headquarters at Fort McClellan, Alabama. So it was the only uh, post in the world that had two flagpoles, two ceremonies and everything else. So in some respects we were very separate yet we rode with the officer of the day in the evenings and that kind of thing. But what I found was we were very different when we were in McClellan than when we were out in the rest of the world. And a lot of it had to do with, I talk about command versus influence. And the military is very much into command. So it's, you do what I say, there's no, um, discussion, nothing, it's, it's my way or the highway. But we as women had a bit of influence in that as well. So we were willing to have a discussion, we were willing to talk about things. And yet, when we joined together, the women actually had to lower their standards in order to be part of the men's army, which I thought was like, excuse me, why can't we bring them up to what we're doing? But also at that time, you couldn't be married, you couldn't get pregnant, and, or you were basically asked to leave. So there was this whole, definitely this whole gender thing. Um, we couldn't rise higher than a colonel. At that, at, when I started, we could not be a general. So there was this, this truly glass ceiling that we had to break through, which we did. What I find interesting is that the young women today who are in the, the academies and coming up in the ranks and are now really blended with the men have little to no idea what it took to get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. They don't know what we did, how we showed up, um, what we had to do with our male counterparts to make them listen to us and to... Um, you know, understand and value us. Uh, there was a woman who spoke to us about um, getting the Ranger tab. And she was one of the first three women to earn the Ranger tab. And she said, it was remarkable. I would stay up all night discussing gender uh, equality with these guys who said, I believe that if I earn my Ranger tab the same time you do, it will be devalued because a woman also won it. And she said, do I carry a 75 pound pack just like you do? Well, yeah, you do. Did I haul your sorry ass from the field <laughs> back because you were supposed to be wounded back? Did I ask anybody to help me? Well, no. So how can you say that I'm not working at the same level you are, that there is not equality between us? So I, I think that understanding is lost on our millennials because we don't talk about what it took to get us to where we are today and how much further we have to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good point. How many of you have seen the movie uh, on the basis of sex, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg movie? Yep. I yeah. think that really, that really highlights Linda, what you're talking about. What mm -hmm. she went through and pioneered back in the early seventies is incredible. Yeah. There were like 178 like laws on the book that were gender discriminating. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she started off, I think it was in 72, but what she went through and what she had to do to become uh, where she is, is, is incredible. She graduated, I think, top of her class at Columbia and couldn't get hired by a, uh, a New York law firm. Right, yeah. Because she, because she was a woman. Yeah. Think about that. 
And it's and do you remember hard. remember the, the line that they said about you would be taking a job away from a man? A man. Yeah. You know? And that's I mean what what do you guys think about that? About that whole concept? Well, I don't think it's true, for one thing. Um, and I guess what I find interesting, too, is the fact that, quote, when we started to discriminate against men in um, going into medical school or law school, where the quotas were, you know, we take women first and then, uh, and also blacks. So it was a, it was a race and gender uh, change. And they sued. Mm -hmm for discrimination. And I thought, excuse me, but we've been discriminated against forever. And you have the audacity to sue because as a privileged white, sorry, white male, <laughs> you didn't get a position in this particular class. You gotta step up. You've gotta increase your scores, whatever it takes to run equal to the women who are, and, and the, you know, race, uh, black men who are getting in because they they stepped up and got their scores up and were able to step in and actually get it because of merit not because of class or race mm -hmm. yeah so oh, you look at the whole some... movement from um you look at the whole women on boards 2020 and why is that necessary and you know there are still so many companies out there that just think it's a chore like why do we have to have women in our boards and and really i'm on several boards myself and i feel like i really add value and i and i feel like there's always just one or two perspectives out there and that some people are almost afraid to speak up and fortunately for me i'm never afraid to speak up <laughs> and i tend to offer really a, a, a totally different sometimes i play devil's advocate even if i'm the only female in a room full of 12 to 15 other board members and they're all men. And they're like, you know what? I'm really glad that you asked that question. We didn't think about that. And you have such a different point of view and we're just, thank you for bringing it up. And sometimes it sparks conversations that some of the guys wouldn't have brought up. Mm -hmm. And then since the female brought it up, they're like, oh, now let's start talking about it. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I think there's a reason that there's an initiative to, to put more women on boards. We simply have a different experiences, different perspective. Women can tend to be a little more compassionate, have a little more empathy. We tend to use our instinct a little more than just complete an intellectual um, point of view. It's, it's a little bit of a both. So I think hopefully this isn't a problem 20 years from now. It's just, it's just second nature that women are involved in, in everything. This is such an opportunity right now with where we're at in the world. And I'm really seeing that, you know, we all have different pieces of this puzzle, whether we're men or women or whatever race or culture we come from. And so the, the challenge to the opportunity is how do we really listen to each other and, and are honest with each other? Because there's a level of transparency that I think we have to have as well. And, um, you know, early in my career, I was in, in corporate and I was so fortunate to have a woman leader who, as I was promoted, she was promoted and she had a very much a feminine style of leadership. And she, she had people that followed her from five different companies, you know, in the high tech industry in Silicon Valley. She was really an exception. I was very fortunate to, to have that experience. And at the same time, so many of my clients come from corporate and they become entrepreneurs and they and like one of my clients said i'm the worst boss i ever had <laughs> yeah yeah right because it's like you you take the good with the bad yeah and so we're at this pivotal i mean this is no news to any of you but we're at this pivotal point right now where are we going to go forward with the old ways the old structures the external structures and the internal structures the mindset Mm -hmm. Or are we going to be honest and have these kinds of conversations and, and co-create together? So um, that's personally what I'm really excited about. And, and I look forward to what that looks like in terms of gender equality as well. I know this <laughs> one's focused on gender, but, uh, and I've said this to Michelle directly, and I think every CWI meeting that I've attended, uh, I just, to uh, Jennifer's point, uh, there was a phrase by... I can't remember who, who shared it, but it struck me. The diversity of thought 
which really means everybody has a different thought on whatever subject, whatever. And once we embrace that, and we really have an outward mindset that everybody's opinion, again, they call it the diversity of thought, uh, that's where we'll get really better. But unfortunately, because of history and because of some of the things in the divisiveness in the country, we still have that, we still have a lot of individuals, organizations, and cultures that uh, are, you know, still self-focused. There's, there's still, it's, it's about what widget we can get done or what object can we do as opposed to we're working with people and it's people matter. So. Yeah, I so agree. And I think in a lot of cases, what we're seeing is, is the, okay, I'm, I'm going to say the masculine model of leadership, which is around command. I'm going to tell you what to do and you're going to do what I tell you to do. Uh, and it's who we see as our role models, whether we want to or not, but that's who my mentors were, were all men. And that's the leadership style that I was taught. And it really wasn't until I got on my own that I went, there's got to be a better way. And we talk about the softness and the empathy and the creativity and the collaboration and the community that a woman brings to leadership. And that unfortunately is perceived as weakness Weak. as opposed to being a strength. And so oftentimes it's like, I don't understand this. I, I, I don't like this. What do I need to do? So I'm, I'm actually teaching, uh, bringing those both together. And as Patty said, in what I call calm, fluential leadership, where the feminine leads because she's got all the, the fun stuff, you know, the creativity and the collaboration and all of this, but she needs the masculine with his organization structure and strategy to support her in that. And in often cases, he's looking for, how can I support you? But we don't often go to the masculine side to bring that forward. And so I want to see more confluential leaders who embrace both sides and can really make that turn on a dime because we need to pivot. We need to be agile. And having both of those together, I think, brings that pivoting and that flexibility and that ag agility into the leadership equation. You know, all these things. No, please go ahead, Debbie. The conversation just reminds me of a couple threads of thought. You know, um, I worked for a nonprofit for a while that we realized that what we were teaching students was, which we hated the term soft skills, mm -hmm. but these feelings of life skills, collaboration, assuring we understood what the problem was, moving ahead. And too often, I think women are tasked with the soft skills, you mm -hmm. know, that are important, but they're not valued. And when a woman has confidence and has soft skills and even does command, because as a leader of organization, there has to be some command there as well. But the benefit of a woman there, I think, is that they bring, when the benefit is that a woman will build a bigger table where a man will exclude right? That's yes. how I describe a boardroom. You know, the woman's thing is like, well, there's more opinion. Let's bring in more, more thoughts. There's not an exclusion. The other thing is they're criticized. Women generally are criticized for being too confident and cocky. Rarely is that the case for a man. That's mm -hmm. a value that, you know, generations have come for us. And I think it's going to take, unfortunately, Jennifer, my feeling is it's probably going to take more than 20 years because I've lived through more than 20 years of work, <laughs> close to 40. And yes, there's been some change, but not all that much for the top. And um, I, I just, it's really interesting. These, these, these personas that women either have to adopt, adapt, or are given the opportunity to adapt really depend on the pool in which they're swimming. Exactly. Um, because, yeah. and, and the last thing I'll say at this point is, I think the whole pandemic, and this has been happening throughout the, my, my career, women tend to leave corporations because they become entrepreneurs, they become leaders in their community, because there still is this responsibility, whether you want it or not, for raising that family, 
making sure the kids are being fed. Now they have to be schooling them. Now there's such a divide between haves and have nots. Can you imagine, you know, the differences that certain women are facing in, in the country, whether you're white and employed and married or with partner, single and unemployed, black or Hispanic and not employed. Think of what's going on in this country now. And it's, to me, it's less optimistic than what you said, Jennifer. I get very concerned about women as we move forward. Well, I, think I actually have a question for the group, if I may. Linda had brought up her experience in the military. My experience in the corporate world is really primarily in the health and productivity space. So I spent a lot of time with nurses and doctors. And, and, and if you look back to the, the old days of where, you know, the hierarchy between the, the, uh, the physician primarily, as Linda pointed out back in the, the medical school days, being male and the compassion and the, the, the nurses being one of the most trusted uh, occupations. The question I have is, has there been advancements in that field from your perspective? Or is it still in the healthcare world that gender, gender inequality or bias, if you may? I'm just, I'm curious. I think what's interesting, because yes, I was an RN as well. I've done more than you want to know about, but, um, when I started, the nurses still got up when the doctor walked in and needed to do his chart notes. Uh, they, all, they deferred to the doctor, even though they knew more about the patients than the doctors did. I mean, the doctor came in, looked at him, left, and it was up to the nurse to really take care of their medical care. Um, and it's interesting, I, again, I had a colleague who wrote videos for new products, new drugs, this kind of thing. And she was working with this company who said, you know, she's sort of sketching out what she's gonna do and whatever. And he says, you know, we just want them to know the facts and, you know, just bing, 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 bing. Don't, don't do any of that soft stuff. She said, oh, you mean that nursing stuff? He goes, yeah, yeah, we don't want that in the video. So they filmed it and they took a look at it and they go, you know, this would be a great place for the doctor to say, blah, 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 and educate the, the patient. And you know, so they went through the whole thing like this. And she goes, so what you're telling me is you want that nursing stuff in here. And I went, yeah. So they're, they're seen as having the soft skills. The other challenge in the healthcare industry is also access to healthcare. And women have a harder time getting access to healthcare because again, oftentimes they're poor, they're not employed, whatever it might be. And so there's a, an inequality in our healthcare environment as well. And it's too expensive trying to get your medications. Uh, and while they tell you that um, you, know, you, you can get this card from XYZ company, but you have to qualify and not everybody qualifies. So um, I, we, we used to say in nursing that nurses ate their young you went in and the top nurse was like a drill sergeant and you know you had to, you had to follow her commands and what she was saying and all of that and basically they made it as hard as possible because we needed i hate to say this we needed to grow a hard skin in order to be able to succeed in that environment so, no, I, I want to. Yeah, I, I, I'm, yeah. I want to hear from you. I want to know what happens have. when you take a mixed gender group out, or what you've seen there. Well, I, I, I just want to share a story to to piggyback on Linda's point because I think, like, I think everybody agrees that equality would be better for men in this this ladies' room, um, but it's not there, and it's there's systemic problems that are keeping it from being there. So my wife is an orthopedic surgeon. She just went to the dentist and was seen by a uh, 06, a Navy captain, older woman, who is the doctor, a dentist. And the woman, even though my wife had an orthopedic surgeon name tag and everything, white coat on, she's like, oh, are you like a nurse? And you know, it, it's just baked into us in this really powerful way. Yes. But I don't think, you know, there are people that, that just don't get it and don't want to get it. And that's, that's one thing. But 
like I want to get it. And I think there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of ego and, you know, I, down, deep down somewhere I'm afraid, well, what if Jennifer is the leader and she's, you know, more caring and empathetic and does a better job than me. And then I have to figure out how to totally change my leadership style. Uh, and so you have a lot of white men in that power position who maybe aren't trying to maintain that purposefully, explicitly, but certainly implicitly, uh, at least don't have an impetus to do anything about it. And that's, that I think is the core of the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no bet. I mean, we're looking for benefits. You know, what, what do I get out of it? If I do this, what do I get out of it? And mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, you get criticism from your, your male colleagues of buck up, be yeah. strong, get some, some steel in your spine um, in order to be successful. And oftentimes my, my male clients are going, I'm trying to learn the other side. I know how to command. I need to know those soft skills without seeming too emotional. Uh, and so th that's why sort of the blending of the two seems to work. And I found m men get on board with it because it's a skill that they don't have. And they're finding that their, their teams are leaving their uh, customers are what I call one and done. I don't want to work with you anymore. I don't, I don't like this. And so they move on. So we need to bring that feminine aspect in with the strength that we have. I mean, we have the whole, you know, uh, I, what is it? Steel magnolias, mm -hmm. you know, that, that there's that steel in their spine and Southern women ruled. I mean, look at Scarlett O'Hara and what she was able to do in Gone with the Wind. You know, so there, there are role models out there. It's, it's a question of how do we say it's okay to have that skill? And well, I, I think, you know. I think Knight, you sort of hit it in saying it is so deeply ingrained in us to the point that a woman who has achieved a, a certain high level in her career would look at another woman who has achieved a similar level and assume she's a nurse. You know, that's, that just shows you how deeply ingrained that is in us. And um, the idea that we had to have a, a law, a regulation that said you have to have women on these corporate boards just, you know, harkens back to the whole time of affirmative action, you know, and, and man, look what the country blew up over the idea of, of affirmative action. But if, if people won't get it themselves, if there's not a movement to make that change, then I guess you have to legislate change, which doesn't make anybody happy. But if it's not going to happen organically, what are you going to do? You know, I mean, there, there were people back, I'm old enough to remember when affirmative action was first introduced. And um, most of the rest of you are probably not, I'm ancient. So there you go. <laughs> but, but I'm older was, than dirt. So that's fine. <laughs> but it was very much the, hey, you took my job. Yeah. That person took my job. You know, I should have gotten that job. Well, who said you should have gotten that job? You know, there was this, this uh, assumption that you're not qualified for it. It's just because of some affirmative action thing. You're not qualified to serve on this board. It's just because we have to have a woman, you know? So I, I don't know what I would much rather have change happen organically, but like I said, if it won't happen that way, then then maybe it has to be done through legislation. And Patty, I've I've been mentoring um, job seekers, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of them are in the high tech industry. They're project managers, and you know they're very strong women. And they come to me and they go, you know, I don't understand this. I use I brought ideas to my boss of projects that we could do that would you know save the company money um you know grow their revenue and i i stayed it all out and my boss would say that's very interesting let me take a look at that and see what we can do and she said i walk out and the next thing i knew my counterpart male had my project mm -hmm. and was running it and i said did you ever say to your boss when you gave him a project, and I want to be the project lead on this. She goes, oh no, I would never do that. I said, well, if you don't step into that, if you don't tell them 
that you're willing to do this? Because oftentimes what I hear is, well, she never said she wanted to be considered for this job. Mm. And I said, you have to say to him, I want to be the project lead on this. If you don't think I'm qualified, then I want to be the co-lead so that I can learn what I don't know, so I can lead the next one. No man would say that when they've asked for it. I've been no. around male counterparts and there's no, and if I don't need it, you know, and yeah. I don't, I don't mean to sound bitter. I've worked with great men and great women, you know, that's, oh, yeah. but, but the fact that, you know, it's very depressing to me that, yeah. that, <laughs> that here we are in 2020 and we still are dealing with bosses who are mostly white men who are delivering your work to someone else. I mean, that's just snaky. You know, let's call it, right? Yeah. And so that's why I think a lot of women leave the workforce because we don't want to take it anymore. You know, there's just too much of this BS going on in the world, in the work world, that makes us feel more confident by being independent. And Knight, I am curious about your outdoor ed too and how the mixed gender groups get together and what you see because in that environment it's really a raw environment so you don't have all the accoutrements of work yeah. i would love to hear a little bit more about what you do um yeah. and, and what you observe well what's what's really interesting we started doing women specific events because i rei i was teaching for them five years ago and they did a level playing field trying to get more women outdoors. Uh, so they did a bunch of women specific classes. And ironically, there weren't enough women guides to teach rock climbing. So I got one of these classes and the, the change was palpable. The, the difference between a mixed gender or a mostly man versus all women with rock climbing was crazy in that there was a lot of drive it wasn't like, oh, it's okay if you don't make it. No way. These women were like, no, honey, you're going to the top. Mm -hmm. I'm not letting you down until you get to the top. And it, but it wasn't about ego. It wasn't like measuring who got far, farther up. And I just, that was a powerful experience for me to witness. Um, and honestly, we, our events are typically 50-50 men and women, which we're very proud of. We don't work really hard to do that. Like we're not trying to do that but we're happy with it and we would if we didn't have that. Um, and I think it's great if you have a male executive who's not used to sitting around a campfire and getting uh, some angst downloaded on him, it's a really powerful experience. And I mean, it's a conversation much like this. So uh, the outdoors is really good. And I just finished this book, Annapurna and Arlene Bloom led the first expedition on an 8,000 meter mountain, uh, Annapurna. And back to, I think, Linda, you were talking about ranger school and the standards. She's very transparent in that book. Like, women can't carry as much weight. My wife was pegged for going to do infantry uh, officer course for the Marine Corps. And she's like, no way. I'll break my ankles. You carry, you know, 150-pound packs. But they were more successful because they relied on each other. They had teamwork. They just built a plan that accommodated uh, carrying less weight, you know, another day in the plan here or there because they would do more hauls. Uh, and they had, the, and they came out of it liking each other, which is not the same. Most most men led or, or predominantly men expeditions, you probably come out not liking each other very much because you're competing and there's a lot of ego. And uh, so I, th I think it's the outdoors brings out the best in us. And I think they're inherent strengths that women have. I love what Jennifer was saying with, you know, the board all of a sudden seeing this new perspective. Like, why are we not tapping into that? It's crazy to me. Um, but I don't think men want to hear that. Right? Mm -hmm. I, more men need to come to the ladies' room and hear Jennifer talk about the perspective she brings to the board. Hi. You know, I'll share with you. Um, you know, I'm a female CEO in a completely male-dominated industry. I mean, how many women do you know own accounting firms? Like hardly anybody. And if, if they do, it might be a smaller accounting firm, right? So I have 65 employees here at Optima. I have my chief operating officer is a 60 year old male. My, um, I'm hiring a, a new uh, vice president, executive vice president and CFO, and he's a late fifties man. But the rest of my company is about 70% females. 
And so for, for me, I am always focusing on giving a good opportunity, whether you're male, whether you're female, what it doesn't matter what you look like. It, it matters about your attitude and, and the value that you bring to an organization. And what I've always had a hard time with, to be completely honest, in terms of my challenges, is being, uh, you know, I'm in my early 40s. And I'm a very high D on a disc scale, which is very kind of dominating, commanding. Um, I like things done quickly. I have a sense of urgency. I'd like to think I'm a bit be, like in the middle between being tough-minded and kind-hearted. So I think that kind-hearted, that sensitive, I want to help you, I really care, really helps people understand that I, I genuinely want the best for them. But the tough-minded, completely honest, I get called bossy. Oh, boss lady. Oh, you're, t oh, you're a little bit too tough. Or you can be a, you know, a, a B word, you know, oh, Jen, Jen's a little bit, you know, ag aggressive or whatnot. And, and so I, I struggle with how do I be commanding and, and be the captain of my ship without coming across um, at all obnoxiously aggressive, right? If, if anybody has heard the, the, the book or read the book or heard about the speaker about radical candor, and it's, it's really quite cool. Um, I actually have the, I have the book um, and it's, and it's, you know, it, it's kind of a mix between, you know, do you have these radical candor conversations by being kind and gentle and smart and, you know, challenging people without being obnoxiously aggressive. And I think so many women find themselves in the, they're either being obnoxiously aggressive or they're being, you know, too empathetic or too, too softies or too much of a pushover. So getting that balance without coming across too tough and too stern, I work at it all the time. I mean, it's, it's a constant struggle. And men are being, oh, you're a leader, you're strong, you're confident, you're, you know how to command. But when a woman's commanding, oh, you're just boss lady, you know? Mm -hmm. Jennifer, do you get that feedback from uh, some of your best female uh, employees? In other words, uh, do they give you a hard time about being uh, too assertive? The ones that are your, are your stars, your, you know, your next generation of leaders? I don't necessarily get that feedback from anybody, but I understand perception really well. And I mean, I was with Tatum, which is a CFO controller consulting firm. Um, about 10 years ago, I was one of the Tatum senior controllers and I was in my late twenties. And, you know, you'd get this perception from people and I just didn't let it bother me. I just know it exists. I can tell when I'm talking to someone, I can tell when people make comments that that's how they're perceiving things. And they might say things like, oh, what a boss lady. Oh, you're so like, you know, um, but it's, it's probably not so much from the female controllers and executives that I have on my team. It's from random people that perceive me as, oh, you seem like you're really tough. You'd be really tough to work for and whatnot, or um, I don't know. I don't necessarily hear it, but um, but I'm aware of it. Yeah. And I wonder, do we, do we do that to ourselves in a way? Like did, did somewhere along the way, did you learn? And I, I understand about, you know, disc makeups and so forth, but did somewhere along the way, did you learn that was the way that you were supposed to be a leader? Was that, uh, has that one, is that one of those deeply ingrained things? Like, you know, if you're going to be a leader, you need to be, really strong and assertive or is it just um you know other people's perspectives um uh, that that their their enculturation is rubbing off or coming out instead i'm about a constant being a work in progress in general i mean i've been in vistage for five years yeah. i've been in other executive groups i surround myself with other ceos and other strong women I'm an entrepreneur's organization. I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of uh, self. I recognize what my strengths are and like what, where I'm a little bit weak. And, and so I've done EQ assessments and I'm constantly working to be better, especially as a young female. I guess I'm not that young. I'm in my forties, but you know, as a, as a female running an accounting firm, I really have to be conscious of it. 
And if I want to continue having high retention and continue attracting and retaining really great people, you know, I always need to work on myself. I mean, I'm not, I, I recognize that I'm not perfect. And so I, I, maybe I seek out the feedback more than other people might. And I am super resilient and I'm very tough and I've got super thick skin. So I just, I'm confident. It doesn't need, it doesn't really bother me. I just know that it's, I have to work on it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Vasi, what the whole topic here is gender equality is good for everyone. So mm -hmm. why do you think having a more equitable workplace, you know, in, in terms of gender, why is that good for a company? Do you think? I think it's good for a company or a business because it's it's because of that balance that we need. We're so out of balance in our in our systems and our structures. To go back to what Knight was saying too, that so much of this is systemic. So whether it's like Jennifer said, where you're bringing in the different you know viewpoints or strengths, you know that balance is so important. And and I know I've heard from my male clients um, how it's not really working for them either. Those structures oh, yeah. aren't working. Those systems aren't working. And so let's be honest about it. You know, let's go, okay, you know, we've been doing it this certain way. We've, we've made some fine tuning adjustments, but you know, we're still off the mark here. We're still woefully out of balance, especially in the bigger corporate structures. So, um, so to go back to your question, why is it good? Why is it good? Because we need to um, have more of a strengths-based approach and we need more strengths in the mix. Mm -hmm. So the more we have different genders, different cultures, different, you know, ethnicities, the more that we can bring. To me, it's like, well, being a painter, it's like the, the more colors you have, the more textures, the more rich, you know, the artwork is, the more um, unique it is. Yeah. So I think what's missing perhaps from the bigger conversation is what is it that is in the highest good for all? So for the company, you know, we get bogged down in a lot of these rules or things or this or this perception, but you know, if we can focus on what is the biggest, uh, what is the highest outcome for us, um, all that stuff can fall away. You know, it, it really can. Um, and I was just reflecting on, uh, well, maybe it'll come back to me an, an example of that. What happens when we go, okay, what is it that our clients really need? <laughs> what is it that we're filling in the marketplace? What is it we're bringing to this conversation, mm -hmm. you know, that will serve everyone, you know, and then open it up. Let's, let's bring it on. That's so a little, it's a little vague, but you know, I just want to put that piece out there too. Right. Right. Hey, Tracy, from, from an HR perspective, cause I'm sure that you get this you know, when you were in corporate, you probably had it sitting across you at the desk. And now that you're doing consulting, what, what kinds of gender inequality, not examples of inequality, but the result of an inequality, you know, that would, would drive us to want to make a change in that? You know, um, a lot of things that some of you have said during our conversation really resonate with me because you know, I've seen examples of situations where, you know, a position is open and um, a male candidate will throw their hat in the ring, whether they can do the full scope of the job or not. And a female candidate um, that has lots of potential, if they can't do 100% of that job, they won't, they won't throw their hat in the ring. And in my past experience, we've had to nudge people to say, we think this is something you should really consider. And I was really pleased that, you know, I've worked with firms that have had the intention of wanting to have equality and the opportunity. And so by nudging those individuals to be considered, a lot of times they were selected. And the one thing about women that is amazing is they won't let themselves fail. They will figure out you know, how to get the resources, how to get the job done. Mm -hmm. And every single female that was in that situation was successful once they were placed in the role. But they sometimes needed um, to have someone show them that they saw the potential and to have the confidence to encourage them. So I definitely see that. 
Um, the other thing that had come up was around the soft skills and it's really interesting because there's this kind of um, contradictory um, situation where people get hired for technical skills and sometimes companies don't invest in training for some of the softer skills, but where people are let go is because of their soft skills. You, you don't usually see someone being let go because they're technically deficient. It's usually some behavior or their communication style or aggressiveness or something like that that is what makes it um, end up where they end up separating with the company. Yeah, those interpersonal things, you know, and in thinking about what, what you just said about women will not see themselves in a role, you know, um, just today, Jennifer, you know, probably know this, you know, just today Citibank named their first female CEO. First first female CEO at that level um, of financial organization. And I heard her being interviewed this morning and um, they were saying, well, how great this is, the first female CEO. And, you know, did you want to be this? Did you aspire to be this? And she literally said, no, I never, I never really saw myself in this role. I never really thought, you know, I, I felt like I had so much still to learn. And I thought, holy moly, you know, <laughs> at, at this at this level, at your level of expertise and, and brilliance and, um, and here you're being elevated to this position and, and it, it was like an oh shucks, you know, and I mean, it, it was, I'm a little disheartened, you know, by, by the way she presented herself, but. So Patty, Patty well, the question that comes to my mind for that is why not, right? Yeah. Why, why didn't she? Like, like what's underneath that? Because that's, that's, I think a clue for a lot of women too. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've heard that come up at CWI events too. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. well, and I, think I would just chime in really quick because I'm taking all this in and I thank everybody for their insight because this has been very, you know, informative. Um, I did not see that interview. I didn't turn, I've been staying away for TV for good reasons. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think that women, um, they just, they tend to be wired um, to have more humility. And I think that that can really work in their favor when it's used or it's coupled with confidence. And that really only comes if we do the work, you know, hard and, and support each other. And as I'm taking all this in, you know, right now I'm in commercial real estate and I have been for 20 years and coming from Manhattan, and that was definitely male dominated. And prior to that, um, I was an attorney, a litigator, definitely male dominated. I can tell you <laughs> as a young lawyer, I did not at all feel comfortable going into, into the courtroom as a female. I didn't, I felt like it was the boys club, but I'm not complaining around all that. Then I took off like eight years to have four kids and I had four kids in a row. And you know what? I did that really well. And that's where I was the CEO and that's okay with me. I have um, four children, three adult boys and the last one's a girl. And, you know, I do my part in a couple of different ways to, to, course correct what's gone on historically is you know I, I've taught my boys you know how strong women can be I've led by example by being very successful in my own right you know in a professional capacity outside the home I can be a mom and I can do that and I you know and the importance of education and inclusion and then them having a, a you know a younger sister you know what it's like to empower women and to support them and to you know and I've always mentored you know once I got back out there on the second career leg and I had some life experience, you know, underneath my belt, you give back. And to some degree, I think there has to be like a little bit, I don't know if reverse discrimination would be the word, but where women are truly supporting women, women that can be leaderships with all the skills, the positive skills that we're talking about tonight and really help them. Now, sometimes that may be at the exclusion of a guy, but we've got a long way to go, right? So I think that, you know, um, like was just mentioned earlier by, I think it was Tracy, I'm looking around the, the little <laughs> the zoom, that, you know, sometimes we need a nudge. We need to be told that we can and we are capable. And once we adopt those beliefs for the people that are a little bit behind in that, you know, you go get it. And boy, I'll tell you, a woman really will, um, she'll, she'll come to the table and then some because we have to overprove. But I think that's true about anything that would be classed as a minority, you know, so it's, um, 
I don't, you know, it, it's unfortunate. It's come a long way. I don't think any of that's really going to fundamentally change because genetically speaking, we are the ones who give birth. And until something like that changes, I think that the hiatus that we, we take when we become moms and a lot of, you know, even if you're, whether you leave the professional arena like I did for a period of time, or if you try to juggle those two things, the fact of the matter is a, a woman is, is going to be the one who, you know, who, who takes that professional hit, you know? Um, but also I, I'll, I'll, I'll say this too. A lot of my friends and myself included, we are the bread earners in our family. Our, our husbands are working, but we out earn them. Okay. So there's that kind of change in the balance. And um, there's a lot, it, it's now socially or professionally acceptable, maybe not embraced, but acceptable for a man to stay home. My brother stays home full time while his wife is a big wig at JP Morgan here in San Diego. So it's, um, you know, it, it, it's happening, you know, and we have to do our part. But I do think that, you know, I think that women have to support women and, and, and get around the jealousy and, and not at the exclusion of Ed or Knight, but you guys have had a head start, <laughs> you know, it's like, so it's, uh, you know, I, I it, when I have a choice, I would look at a woman, if, if you know, that it was apples and apples, I'd say, okay, I'm going to choose the female really because of her gender, because I, I do see them as a class that needs that extra support to tell you the truth. But, um, I think Danielle, Danielle, first of all, congratulations with the parenting and setting such a great example for your children. I'm the oldest, oldest of four boys, so my mother was a social worker for the state of Maine, and she gave me the, the same kind of example of what a woman could and should and all that kind of stuff, and I feel mm -hmm. grateful for that. But a, a quick comment on the support. Um, I've had the privilege, I'll use the word privilege, of coaching a state champion uh, uh, girls team in the state of Ohio soccer team. Wow. And people ask me all the time, what's the difference with co coaching you know, boys teams or coaching girls teams? And it really goes to your point, Danielle, and this is not a generalization, but this has been my personal experience. Guys bond when they get in the battle. So they'll jump right in, and then when they're battling, that's when they bond as a team. The mm -hmm. women needed to bond prior to the battle to feel again part of that but once they did once they bonded they were probably better connected than the men because of the way they went about doing it yeah. if that makes it's, sense it's a collaborative effort i think that's the way we do it Ed. that's a really good point mm -hmm. it's not so much a, a show of strength with women and this is my experience and i'm just saying generally speaking right there can be isolated situations that don't support what i'm about to say but i find that women can be more collaborative and so they're prepared to, to, you know, go do that game as opposed to just going out there and, you know, throwing around a lot of muscle. So it's, um, yeah, it's interesting. And I think something that, that's not happening right now with the millennials uh, is we are not mentoring them. They, there's about 65% of the millennials who say that their leadership skills are not being developed the way they could be, should be, and they're disappointed, they, they wanna know why. And in, in some cases, I think it's because there are, the, there are no mentors out there or they don't know how to um, choose them, to pick them. Um, I know my daughter's at Nationwide Insurance and I said, so do you have a career path? Do you know where you're going? You know what your next job looks like? And she goes, no, they don't do that here. Mm -hmm. Their HR department is, I hate to say this because I was in HR as well. Um, it's like they pull their teeth. They have, they don't have a lot of the programs that we had when I was in HR to groom people for more senior positions, moving into, you know, the corporate property piece and really building those leaders, male or female. Uh, and I think that's also a, a really sad thing that we need to correct or is to step in and say, hey, I can mentor you, I can help you with this, uh, and really be up there for them. Um, because basically, they're, they're doing what I call the suitcase economy. Um, mm. They hop from job to job to job to job, looking for that mentor, looking for, you know, how do I move up? You know, how do I grow that? Um, and and they're, they're doing great work, great leadership work in the nonprofit arena, but they're lacking 
in the for-profit arena. And one of the things I'm seeing with my niece who's in her 20s and her friends, this is their first job out of college, that they are really self-selecting for companies where that mentorship and that support is there. That yeah. is a key part of their decision. So the good part of that means that you know, they're aligning in the beginning with that, with mm -hmm. a culture that supports it. The downside of that is that the companies that aren't supporting that are perpetuating that lack of mentoring and leadership. So, exactly. um, yeah. And it shows up in attrition. Mm -hmm. It shows up in not being able to attract the best talent and, um, and all of that, which kind of takes us back to why this is a good thing in our businesses and our companies and our country. You know, it would be, it would be great in our country too. Knight, you started to, to say something. Yeah. I just think there's, there's a responsibility, particularly for men and maybe just to listen and for women to tell men because men are like it or not in that power position to do those nudges intentionally and systematically. And I, I was talking to the CEO who has a, a woman who's a star performer who just had a child and he wants to promote her into the senior ranks and she doesn't want to. And she says, well, you know, I can't balance the child and all that. And I just don't feel comfortable. And, his answer is like, good. It's like, okay, well, let's work it out. I really want to do this. Let's work it out. But it's not great. And the great answer would be, well, okay, what are the barriers and what can we put in place in our policies that will make that, you know, if it's, you will leave work at 4 p.m. to pick up your kid. That, and that's a rule, not a, oh, we'll just work it out. It'll be okay. Right. Uh, I think that's so important. Having nudges for women to apply to jobs when they are 60% qualified because guys are doing it when they're 10% qualified. Mm -hmm. uh, super important and should be intentional and baked into the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with you very much so. Yeah, very much. Well, you guys, this has been a fabulous conversation. I knew that it would be. And, um, and I, I thank you for being so open with your thoughts and, and your opinions and, uh, and taking this in, you know, in a great, great direction. So I appreciate all of your time, all of you very much. So thank you for giving so much of your time and your effort and your energy to this. And for all of the rest of you who either joined us or will be listening to this playback afterwards, then just keep looking for, for more opportunities to join us in the ladies room or in our Ask Me Anything segments and check out the Connected Women of Influence website and see what we have to offer you. And thanks very much to my two dedicated dudes that joined us here in the ladies room. Ed, you got something to say? Uh, well, I was just gonna say thank you for inviting me and I'm definitely available to, if I can help anybody in any way, uh, feel free to contact me. I'll be more than happy to share my experiences, and uh, if it helps, if it's a mentoring situation, Linda, then I'm, I'm, I'm here to help. So thank you. Awesome. Great. All right. Thanks so everyone. much to all of you again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.